Celebrating 47 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, big news, bird flu seems to have jumped to humans. Plus, more about China's threat to American agriculture. Is China secretly buying farmland in Mississippi? In Southern Gardening, you might be belting out, holy cow, but not for the reason you think. And in our feature, a tough marketplace, the challenges pork producers are now facing. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Mike Russell is on assignment. In our top story, highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI, has passed on to humans. According to CNN, health officials in Texas and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are currently monitoring a second case. Authorities say the person worked on a farm in Texas and had direct contact with a dairy cow. The person tested positive for bird flu last week. The patient's only symptom was an eye infection, and the individual is now getting treatment with a generic version of Tamiflu. Texas health officials are working with local and federal partners to investigate the case, and they have issued a health alert asking health care providers to monitor any additional cases. They also said this second case of bird flu should not impact the milk supply or present a threat to the public. Not long ago, we ran a longer version of the story you're about to see. Basically, it said that bird flu is here to stay and not just a challenge every spring. But knowing what we now know about the movement of bird flu into the human population, here are a few facts worth repeating. Producers lost more than 50 million birds nationwide. The virus rampaged through turkey operations and chicken egg laying houses in Iowa, the country's number one producer of chicken eggs. The annual production of 15 billion eggs was severely curtailed, sending the price through the roof. In the end, more than 77 cases were found among Iowa operations, impacting nearly 33 million birds. Cleanup and compensation for growers across the country cost the USDA over $910 million. Barns were cleaned, new stock brought in, and the focus went to stopping the spread of the virus. Biosecurity protocols were strengthened. Neighbors increased their vigilance, watching out for each other to prevent a new outbreak. During the latest outbreak, nearly 63 million birds have been affected in more than 360 flocks nationwide. Officials with USDA say the chance of HPAI-infected poultry entering the food chain is extremely low and that you cannot get bird flu from birds or eggs that have been properly prepared and cooked. And of course, with poultry the number one commodity here in Mississippi, authorities being very careful to stay on top of bird flu and its potential impact on the state. We spoke to Mississippi's chief veterinarian, Dr. Jim Watson, about this latest development. He characterized the state's preparation as thorough and told Farm Week there is little reason to be concerned about bird flu's direct effect on humans. This virus has been around for uh, at least three years. We had outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza in Mississippi and commercial poultry farms. And so around the country, millions of chickens and turkeys uh, have gotten this disease and died and farmers and, and responders have worked closely in those areas and health departments and CDC closely tracks these things. No individuals have shown any indications of being ill. Uh, at this point, there, there, there does not seem to be any reason to suspect. We don't really know how that individual contracted the disease. It's an individual working on one of these dairies, uh, whether they got it from the birds that were there that gave it to the cows or whether they you know, we just don't know the answers yet. But at this point, CDC and USDA and all of their research and looking at the gene sequences of, of this virus, there's no indication that this virus is changing to a point that it would be more easily transmissible to humans. 
So it appears the situation is contained and authorities are keeping an eye on it. Farm Week will be monitoring things going forward and giving you updates as they become available. In our next story, we continue last week's look into China's buying of farmland in Mississippi and the rest of the U.S. Recently, a Gallup poll showed us what Americans think is the greatest threat to our nation. In this poll, they asked, what one country anywhere in the world do you consider to be the United States' greatest enemy today? China came in first with 41% of the vote, Russia came in second with 26%, Iran in third with 9%, the United States itself 5%, and then North Korea with only 4%. Which leads us back to the question, how much of a threat is this to Mississippi? We asked Andy Gibson, Mississippi's Ag Commissioner, and he told us that shell companies and LLCs are buying farmland here at much higher than market price. Not only that, but no one knows exactly who owns these entities. He also mentioned that both the FBI and CIA have reached out to him while investigating this potential national security threat. No, we really don't know because we, what happens is they'll form a They'll form a local Mississippi LLC or local company. They'll hire somebody here to run that company for them. But upstream, you know, behind the layers of the corporation and the LLC, uh, somebody from China may well be pulling the strings. And even the information that we have about <laughs> land ownership that comes to us from USDA, the USDA would admit that it's not fully accurate because it does not account for who controls these investment companies upstream because they don't have the resources to peel back those layers and find out who really is. Who are these people coming in here offering three and four times land value for farms in Mississippi? It's, it's happening in the Delta. I hear about it regularly. It's happening in northeast Mississippi. I heard about it on Monday night. And... Uh, those are just unknowns. So when we say there's a threat, I agree there's a threat. I think we all know there's a threat, but what we don't know is how, how significant that threat is right now. Uh, but I, I believe that the leaders in Washington are waking up, or, or at least in the House, uh, that had this conference, this uh, committee. And I'll also I think state leaders are beginning to wake up uh, around the country and uh, – uh, we just need to appreciate the threat that exists and then take very careful steps to, uh, to keep it from escalating. On the lighter side, Calabracoa, try to say that three times fast, is a native flower of South America and works best in hanging baskets. Eddie says these plants are sure to give you a wow factor and a truly spectacular pop of color. Here's Eddie. Today, Southern Gardening is at Rivers Greenhouse and Garden Center in Brandon, Mississippi, checking out their awesome selection of Calabracoa plants. Calabracoa, commonly known as Million Bells or Trailing Petunia, is a genus of plants belonging in the Soliaceae family, renowned for its abundant bell-shaped flowers and trailing growth habit. It is a popular choice for hanging baskets and containers. Super Bell's Magic Pink Lemonade is a gorgeous plant that features stunning pink yellow blended color blooms with a yellow throat, reminiscent of pink lemonade. One of my favorites, Super Bell's Double Redstone is a plant with beautiful bright red double blooms that have yellow highlights on the edges of the flower petals. These eye-catching blooms have high impulse appeal and pair perfectly with other strong colors like royal purple. Speaking of royal purple, Calabri Plum has stunning purple blooms with bright yellow throats. Another one of my favorites, and not just because of its name, is Super Bell's Holy Cow. Its flowers are fun and flirty with a soft yellow base overlain with pink splotches and dark yellow centers. Regular watering and fertilizing with a water-soluble fertilizer are necessary to support healthy growth and prolific flowering of all Calipercoa varieties. 
Consider trying any of these beautiful calabacoa plants in your containers and hanging baskets this year. I'm Eddie Smith and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, pork producers having to put a rough stretch behind them. No question the pork industry got pounded in 2023 with feed prices, lower demand, and plant closures. And add to that, trying to comply with California's Prop 12 and pressure on foreign ownership. For a lot of American counties, ag is a top economic driver. How do you stay competitive? Pork producer challenges, that's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy and that people when given facts they understand will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Here's this week's Farm Week calendar. First, a wildlife management field day. Thursday, April 18th at the Coastal Plain Branch Experiment Station in Newton, Mississippi. The program starts at 9 a.m. and covers deer, turkey, and upland habitat, focusing on food plots and land management. This field day is free and lunch is provided. To register, call 601-683-2084, or for more information, call 662-769-9963. Next, another field day, Thursday, June 6, 8 to noon at the Beaumont Horticultural Unit, 478 Mississippi Highway 15 North. Registration and breakfast begin at 7.30 that morning. The program covers vegetable variety trials, disease control, organic production, floral design, wine production, small fruits, and sanitation. For more information, call Christine Coker at 228-546-1013. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through Extension Education. We care about their success and yours. Taking care of what matters. MSU Extension. Time for the market report. This week, we'll be focusing on several USDA reports, what they tell us about U.S. agriculture and their effect on the row crop markets. So markets closed last Friday, still trending up with both row crops and livestock split Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, sugar, up over half a cent, an over 3% rise from the previous week. Last week's biggest loss, lumber, down $24, a near 4% drop from the previous week. So before we get into what these numbers mean for the commodity markets and farmers in general, we should set the stage for what was one of the biggest movers last week, namely several USDA reports that give us a good idea of what to expect this coming planting season, as well as what our current stocks of grain look like. In the grain stocks report, corn stocks totaled nearly 8.5 billion bushels, up 13% from March last year. Soybeans totaled almost 2 billion bushels, up 9% from last year. And wheat totaled a little over a billion bushels, up 16% from last year. In the rice stocks report, rough rice totaled 100 million hundredweight, up 31% from last year, while milled rice stocks totaled just under 6.5 million hundredweight, up 48%. And in the prospective plantings report, corn acres estimated at 90 million, down 5% from last year. Soybean acres estimated at nearly 87 million, up 3%. Wheat acres estimated at just under 48 million, down 4%. And cotton acres estimated at nearly 11 million, also up 4% from last year. And in the quarterly hogs and pigs report, U.S. inventory at nearly 75 million head, up just 1% from March last year. Breeding inventory a hair over 6 million head, down 2%, and market hog inventory at just under 69 million head, up 1%. It should be noted that the prospective plantings report is released in early spring every year and is considered a barometer of what U.S. farmers' intentions are. What made the markets move was the addition of soybean acres and the decrease of corn acres. 
And that leads us into our row report. With all the price fluctuations and reports to shift through, how can we make sense of the bigger picture? I sat down with MSU row crop economist Will Maples to get his thoughts on what the implications truly are and what we can expect here in Mississippi and beyond. So Will, the prospective plantings report recently came out. What is it telling us about what farmers are wanting to do? Yeah, so USDA every March will survey farmers about what do they intend to plant this year. So, you know, this, this isn't actual survey of what is actually in the ground yet, but what is the, they intending. And so a lot of times the markets is what driving these in intended plantings. So in this report, we uh, kind of as we expected, we're seeing less corn and more soybeans across the nation. The market expected this with the, where corn has been lately from a price standpoint, it's not been as competitive as it has been in past years. Uh, last year, we planted a lot of corn at nearly 95 million acres. So with that, we've had a depression in price. Uh, we've carrying over a lot of stocks from last year. So corn acreage had to come back. Uh, it's kind of on the low end, though, of where a lot of industry experts thought it would be. 90 million acres was kind of the lowest estimate that industry thought. So it's not really a bullish market factor yet, but it's right on the edge. So as we get into planning with corn, it's going to be a very important if any weather delays. We could probably see a pretty nice price rally in the corn market as we go through plantings. On the soybean side of stuff, uh, we expected more acreage to come in. Soybean stocks are tight. Uh, we needed more acreage. The market needed some breathing room, and the estimate came in about where we expected it to be. So on the cotton side, it looks like acreage is also up a little bit too. Yeah, so acreage has come up on cotton. Uh, cotton prices have had a nice little rally through the winter. It's back over 82 cents or so last uh, last few weeks, pushing 84 cents. And kind of as we talked about with these lower corn prices, that has made cotton a pretty more attractive crop from a profitability standpoint for many producers. I mean, when I was traveling around this winter, I heard a lot more cotton folks talking about planting cotton this year compared to corn. Going back to planting, I know the USDA also recently released the planting progress report, and it shows that planting has begun. Not quite so here in Mississippi, maybe a little bit here and there, but for the most part, planting has started. Yes, yeah, so some of the southern states are starting to get a little bit of corn in the ground, really in the very southern parts in southern Mississippi, some stuff's going in the ground. We're right at the front of planting season, so it's going to be a volatile couple months in the markets as, you know, planting gets rolling, any delays come into play, uh, how can that affect these planting intentions numbers, any delay in corn plantings due to weather could lower that corn acreage, which would put us in a very much a bullish market. Uh, you know, if that number drops much below 90 million, we could see a good price rally. And the same thing with soybeans. We got those tight stocks. Uh, as the Midwest gets going in another month or so with plantings, uh, if there's delays in that and those numbers potentially drop when we get the June acreage report, it could be a very volatile market going forward. Volatile markets, that's going to be it for this week's deeper look into the markets. In this week's feature, the new year's been a challenge for pork producers across the country. California's Prop 12, which we've talked about, not to mention growing scrutiny over foreign ownership of U.S. land. As you saw earlier in the market section, U.S. hog inventory is up, and with that comes its own set of challenges as producers work to make a profit amid so much red tape. From our news partner, Market to Market, Colleen Bradford Krantz reports. While many segments of agriculture were having a relatively strong year, the pork industry got pounded in 2023. Feed prices were high, demand was down, several major pork producers closed sow farms, processing plants were shuttered. And on the horizon were new rules in California, coupled with efforts to curb foreign ownership of farmland. Both 2021 and 2022 were phenomenal years of growth in U.S. farm income in this country. Uh, I, I think I heard Secretary Bill Sack recently describe 2022 as the second or, or maybe the best time ever for U.S. agriculture. That's not equally felt, however. It, it's commodity by commodity. Brown likes to point out that 2023 can also be viewed as a return to the norm after a few years of strong prices following short supply associated with COVID when packing plants temporarily closed or slowed production. 
I like to remind us that we're just going back to the demand level we might have seen back in 2020. That 2021 and 2022 are going to be what stick out as extremely positive years, not that 2023 is so negative, it's just putting us back on the same track. Iowa State University economists say 2023 brought the worst farrow to finish returns in Iowa since 1998-99. And depending how 2024 goes, the pair might go down as the worst two-year stretch on record. Iowa State University's estimated livestock return model forecasts an average annual loss for hog producers in 2024 at $18 a head which looks bleak, but is an improvement over the loss of $32 a head in 2023. Brown acknowledges that feed costs remain a concern. Corn prices have run high for much of the last few years. I will say it's amazing how well this industry's done with what's been record level corn prices, at least for part of that period of time. I think that's been part of the important profitability question at the end of the day. Um, where hog prices are today, if we were talking about uh, sub $4 corn, the, the profitability would look a lot different than it does today. Although exports have offered some hope to farmers, sales to other countries have slipped back to levels seen before China's African swine fever outbreak that struck between 2018 and 2021. Brown says adding more markets in places like Central America could help reduce the reliance on major players like China. In past decades, when more independent producers were raising hogs, Brown says experts would have expected a more traditional pork cycle, two years up and two years down. If feed costs were to go up, what did the industry do? You would have folks who would not produce at 100% of the capacity they might have had at the time. When you think about where the industry is today, by and large, it's characterized by a lot of very large confinement operations that have huge capital outlays in those facilities. So I, I often say we're becoming much less responsive in the short run to things like higher feed cost, because if I'm operating one of those confinement operations, I have no choice but to be at 100% efficiency. USDA data backs that up as the December 2023 snapshot of the National Hog Inventory sits at 74.9 million, the fourth largest since 1963. Even when sows are cold, those cuts are offset by a typical sow having more piglets every year. The number of piglets per sow per year shifted from 18.2 in 2007 to 21.8 in 2022. Bank accounts might dip further into the red if producers undertake sow building renovations to comply with California's Proposition 12. The new rules, which went into effect at the beginning of the year, dictate that sows must have a certain amount of floor space if their offspring are to be marketed in the Golden State. I just think we're early in the, what's the long-term change that the industry makes trying to service uh, California because, we, again, we know the cost of changing my operation so it's Prop 12 compliant is not zero. I think we're going to have operations continue to grapple with that. Global leader Smithfield Foods closed 35 Missouri sow farms in October of 2023. Officials said many of the buildings were older. They say they are maximizing efficiency during a period of challenging market conditions. Local officials in northern Missouri, where many of the facilities were closed, saw the immediate impact in jobs being relocated or eliminated. Ag in general is our largest economic driver. And when we're looking at you know, livestock crops, you know, specifically here in Mercer County, uh, it is pork production. And so they are our largest uh, employer, almost five out of 10 directly, and another four out of 10 uh, indirectly. Amid all of this, states like Missouri are looking at banning or tightening foreign ownership of land beyond the current limits. Residents of counties like Mercer understand the concerns the state legislature is trying to tackle, but also hope to avoid additional closures by Smithfield Foods, whose parent company, WH Group, is a publicly traded company based in Hong Kong. Obviously, it would be a big impact here. There's tens of thousands of acres in Mercer County that are owned through Smithfield. 
the exact language has gone through several iterations, so we'll have to see what it ultimately it would be. I'd be surprised if there was a total foreign ban, and, and we tend to go with property rights, but we'll have to see. Easter remains optimistic while recognizing the complexity of the debate. You know, if you ask anyone who lives here locally, they would say, well, no, I don't want my, my neighboring farm to be foreign owned, but at the same time, uh, you may have children and grandchildren who are employed by Smithfield, and, and that's what helps funds uh, not just the labor force, but property tax, sales tax for the local area, school districts, emergency medical services. It's a unique balance here. No doubt, a difficult balance indeed. And if you didn't know, here in Mississippi, according to the Pork Producers Council, 2021 pork sales generated over $44 million in personal income, over $66 million in value added, and employed over 1,000 people. Well, next week, told in his own words, the story of Will Gilmer and a dairy farm that's been in his family for a century. We all know the story of people like Will. A third of dairy farmers have gone out of business since 2010. He wants to carry on his family legacy, but Will has had to make a tough choice. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.